and the mom. Mm -hmm. Yep, good thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, y'all will have sunshine and we'll have rain. Yeah, it's it's coming your way. But yeah, I know. <laughs> like in, in Mississippi and Louisiana, uh, the rain will only be two days at the most, maybe three. Yeah. And then hopefully you guys can get out. Um, I want to welcome you all. And like I say, there's a lot of things that are going on today. And this month and this week, we have Afghanistan, the troops pulling out of Afghanistan. We have the Supreme Court denying the um, evictions. We have the moratorium that we thought had another period of time. We've got um, our react starting back. I know y'all just thrilled to death about that. We have a variant <laughs> called Delta that I just don't know what we're going to do with. Um, it's just a lot. So I thought we'd do something fun and different today opposed to talking about issues. So I want to people. Uh, Cindy, wave. Wave, Cindy. She's been talking all morning. Wave, Cindy. Oh, me? Yeah, you. <laughs> Cindy, what about art? Well, I didn't know if you had another Cindy or not. I mean, oh, you know. <laughs> Cindy's one of the RMs in Virginia. And if you're on from Virginia, you might have met her. We also have Amy there and Janet. And of course, you all know Tim. And we have one of the RMs with us, Elizabeth Waits. Elizabeth, are you going to show us your picture or are you going to um, just show us your name? Hey, I'm, I'm just going to show my name today. <laughs> okay. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm, I make up on in the car, so I'm with you. Um, <laughs> But Elizabeth is in our Alabama office. And did we have anybody else with Navigate to join? Okay, don't think so. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Ebony, we're gonna play this little game. And after we play the little game, we'll let Cindy and Elizabeth talk about issues that they find on property to help you. We're closing- I wrote a list for you. Okay, we're closing out our series on MORs and getting a superior, an above average, a satisfactory. So as we close that session out, we're gonna play a little game today. And um, you're going to, it's gonna be true, false. So you can use your, um, what screen do you want to use? The poll, Ebony? Yes, here's the first one. Burial grave plots are an asset. True or false? And don't mm. holler it out. Just don't holler it out. Just just vote. Mm. True or false? Let me get my little mousey to work. This one I get confused on. Okay. So. It seems that we have 60% that says false and 40% that says true. It is true. The grave itself, the burial plot is real estate, it's land. And you can always sell land, you can convert land, uh, you can give a title to the burial plot. Keep in mind, that if your residents, especially those of you who work with senior properties, sometimes they'll bring in this thing and they'll tell you when you're asking about their insurance, they'll bring in something and they'll tell you that they have um, a prepaid burial policy. Well, the prepaid policy is not an asset. The only thing that you can take out of that would be the burial plot because it is land. And sometimes if you look in your newspapers and whatever have you, you'll see where people are save, selling grave sites. So that one is true. Our next one. Okay, the next one today, use the market value of the purchase price, purchase price of stock as the asset value amount. True or false? That's a tricky one. 
Yeah. Let's see how we're voting. Four of seven people have voted. Mm. Are some of y'all still thinking? Yeah. <laughs> I don't see it enough to remember on some of these. Take a while. I don't see anything on my end. You see something on your end? Yeah, we have five and seven people. I can end it now and share the results. Okay. True and false. The majority of you say that it's true. And normally it would be, but the way this question is worded, it's going to be false. And the way it's worded, it says that the market value of the purchase price of stock is the same as the asset value. Well, you know that um, when you get stock for your quote, if your resident has stock and you get stock for your quote, the market value may be $100 a share on Walmart. But if they're using a broker, that's not going to be the actual asset value because you have to deduct expenses. Don't forget with your assets, if there is a penalty like real estate, you can deduct the um, commission, the county taxes, any expenses would, deducted from that would be the same as the actual value amount that you're going to use. There is a tip that I want to tell you about stock though, and we don't see it real often, but if your resident does have stock, make sure that you print a copy of the stock that you pulled for today. You can go out on Google or whatever have you and look up, let's say Walmart, I like to use Walmart, uh, look up Walmart stock and see what it's trading for today. And you can use that trade value as the value, but you have to read their papers to make sure that they're not paying a brokerage fee or the sale or to liquidate that stock. That was a good one. Okay, our next one. If you make an income expense or deduction error on a full certification, you have to complete an IR to correct it. True or false? Now everybody should know this one. <laughs> You're doing your calculations for the five nine. You make a mistake. The resident comes back, and it's not necessarily your mistake. The resident could come in and bring more deductions, more medical deductions, or come in and tell you something about an income, and you've done a full cert, and you know what our full certs are, right? A move-in is a full cert, an AR is a full cert. So how would you correct that? We've got 50-50. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Anybody else want to weigh in? with a true or false on the poll. We have six of 14. Okay, who voted true? Who, who voted true that wants to explain why they vote? No. Okay, Cindy. No, I actually said false because you do a correction to the full cert. Okay, I didn't ask you to get an answer, Cindy. I just asked uh, you. Sorry. No, I didn't. Sorry, I did false. But that's, that's correct, Cindy. That is correct. It is false because you're not going to do an IR, which creates another cert. You're going to do a correction to the full cert. And a lot of times we get those in here and our voucher department says, well, why did they do another IR cert? Why did they do another cert? Why didn't they just make a correction to the cert that's already there? So that was good. Thank you, Cindy. You had well, the right can, I make a, can I make a comment on that? From of course. From dealing with some of the site managers, they don't understand that they can actually go back and do a correction to that cert. They think they have to do the interim to fix it. Because I've had to kind of train a few of them and say, no, that's not how you handle the situation because it affected that full cert that you originally did. So it's not something new that they picked up that they got like a new job or something. It was affecting that 
original search, so you have to correct that search. Yes, and that's why I put questions together. Like I said, we're wrapping up the MOR um, findings. And these are the tricky ones. These are the ones that um, Mary calls the gray area. You don't mm -hmm. have to do another full search. You only, you can do a correction to the last search that you did. And you're right, Cindy, a lot of managers go through the um, process of doing a full search, but they don't have to. They can do a correction to the last search. All right, our next one, Ebony. OAs can accept an internet certification for a reasonable accommodation for an assistance animal. True or false? Another tricky, another gray one. Huh. I'm going to give you a scenario. We come on property. We see that your resident has an assistance animal. We see that the documentation in the file comes from online assistance animal services. Animal services. <clears throat> We're going to question that. So how are you voting, true or false? Everybody says false? Is that our poll, Ebony? I have a 14, six of 13 voting. Okay. 46% say, wait, no. That's 46%. 100% of those responding say false. Very good. The only way you would accept a online documentation to verify whether or not your resident needs an assistance animal is that that online doctor or person who filled it out is indeed the physician for the resident. And most of the time, they're not. And many of you remember not too long ago, HUD came out and said that they weren't accepting these uh, online certificates that uh, people need an assistance animal or for assistance animals. And that's still an ongoing battle that they're, they're fighting against. A lot of airlines now have stopped and they're only allowing assistance animals on the plane if you bring something from the doctor ahead of time and they have the opportunity to verify it with that doctor. So that was very good. Everybody got that one right. Our next one. Okay. Question number five. An OA can accept out-of-pocket receipts for all the following... We don't on our end. We can't. Well, I'm sorry? We oh. don't get on our end. Okay. There we go. An OA can accept out-of-pocket receipts for all of the following upkeep for assistance animals, and that includes food, vet costs, grooming, diamond collar and leash, and puppy pads. True or false? <laughs> Three of 14 so far saying false. Four, saying false. Oh, this might not have been gray enough for y'all. <laughs> Six of 14, false. Everyone's saying false right now. Okay. And you're right, it's false. Um, why is it false, A. Wilson? Hey, Wilson, did you vote, vote false? I did. Okay, why did you vote false? Um, I just, some of the items that she listed just doesn't sound like things that she, we should count. Very good. What in particular? Well, did she say puppy pads? Mm -hmm. uh, name, yeah. them again. name them again, Ebony. Food, vet costs, grooming, a diamond collar and leash, and puppy pads. I think the diamond collar and leash may get it away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you are correct. Uh, Y'all know we live. The ambulance is going by or fire truck or something. Please forgive me. Um, you're correct. Um, 
everything is counted in that list except for the diamond collar and the lease. Now, the lease can be counted because you have a leash law, right? And so um, to buy a leash for your animal is great. Food, you know they have to have food. Veterinarian costs, you know they have to have their shots. Um, the diamond collar, Fifi just does not need a diamond collar. She can have a regular old leather collar, okay? Rather have me a diamond ring. Uh, exactly. Puppy pads. Now, puppy pads have just been added. And let me tell you why they have been added. The handbook says reasonable cost for the upkeep of the animal. And if you have one of these little bitty dogs, uh, let's say the, um, name a little bitty Yorkie. dog. Yorkie. Or Yorkie or something like that. If you have someone uh, who is in your unit and they have those little Yorkies, those little dogs get kind of excited. And before you know it, they've gone in your carpet. Mm. So um, puppy pads can be good. Now puppy pads won't do a Rottweiler much good. So they need to take the Rottweiler out to walk, which brings us to a, another subject. Um, and that is, it would be good, uh, go ahead uh, with your next one, I'm sorry. That's okay. It would be a good practice to have an assistance animal policy. Votes are coming in quickly. Five out of 14, 100% saying true. Okay. Anybody else want to vote? Hmm. Okay. Uh, that is true. It would be in your best interest. What do we know about assistance animals? What we know about them is that they're not referred to as pets, right? That's a no-no. So you can't say that if a resident has an assistance animal that they have to follow the pet policy because that's not true. Assistance animals aren't pets. They provide a service. So it is okay to have a policy for those animals. And some of the subjects that you might have on that policy would be instructions on how to request an assistance animal. Most of you have that in your house rules. Some of you have it as a separate document. Oh, I need to be covered up today. Okay, uh, when and how the need for the animal is verified. How do you plan to verify that? We know that the handbook tells us that we need a third party verification that this resident indeed needs this animal for assistance. And there has to be a nexus between the animal and the disability, right? And they're called all kind of names. They have all kind of names to them. They're called service animals. Um, what are some other names? Um, comfort animals, therapy animals. They're, they're called several names, mm -hmm. but the ADA limits them to just dogs and horses or small ponies. But HUD does not have a limit on theirs. It could be a turtle, a snake, a bird, a dog, a cat, a fish, but it can't be an exotic animal. Can't be a tiger, can't be a bear, can't be a lion, and Going on to name things in your, um, in your policies, you need uh, lease violations, including local municipal violations. And most municipal places have leash laws. So they need to keep that animal on a leash at all times when walking through your property. Fifi can't just take out the door and run and jump up on Mr. Smith and he loses his balance and falls and hurts himself. Okay, so you also need some, um, some lease violations in there. You need responsibilities of the resident. What's the resident's responsibility for this animal? Just because they have assistance animals, 
does not mean that they don't have any responsibilities. They have to clean up behind the animal. They have to keep the animal on lease. Now, one of the biggest things that <clears throat> found lately is that the people with the assistance animal want to go to the common area, especially at the table if they're having food, and they want the animal to fit. <laughs> I have had, I know about four emails asking is this proper, can they do this? I haven't found anything that says they can't unless it's in the assistance animal policy. I talked to um, a young lady afterward, and she says, well, it's not a pet, so they can't stop it. Maybe the person needs the animal to calm them or something. Or maybe they have anxiety, and with their anxiety, their, um, this animal soothes them while they're in this crowd in the common area. But you need to have some type of written directions as, what do you expect? Maybe you want to designate a table for the people who have their animals. You know, um, we had a resident call, I just can't eat at the table with that dog. I'm just sorry. You know, but they have a right to their dog and HUD has not come out with anything in black and white yet. Also, you want to um, include what, what items you will count as out-of-pocket expenses <clears throat> included with the medical expenses. You want to have something about the behavior of the animal. Since HUD does not limit the size of the animals, you can't say, well, you can't have a Rottweiler because they can unless that Rottweiler has proven to be a vicious dog or bothered somebody. So you have to take them on a case by case basis. So you need to talk about the behavior of the animal. Um, you need to talk about the removal and the denial of assistance animals in your policy. If Miss Jones goes into the hospital and she has an assistance animal, could be a cat, could be a, a dog, usually fish do pretty well for a couple of weeks, but somebody has to feed them or they on top of the water. But let's talk about dogs and cats. Who's going to take care of that dog and cat? You need a contact name and phone number. Um, in case Ms. Smith goes into the hospital for someone to come over and to pick that animal up. Again, HUD doesn't limit the size or the breeds of the animals. So if it's a big animal, maintenance can't go in there and bother him because he's not going to let maintenance touch him. So it needs to be someone in your policy that um, is listed by Ms. Smith as to who will remove the animal in case they have to uh, be removed. You also need to talk about the denials. If you're denying them, what's the recourse? What, what steps or actions do they take? And you really should only have a denial if you have that third party verification for one of the exotic animals, you know? Um, so you need to talk about that. Uh, you need to talk about sanitation requirements. Is there a certain area that you're requiring the residents to take their dogs for their waste? You need to talk about guests who bring animals into your unit. That's right. Guests of your residents who have assistance animals can bring their animals with them to visit the residents. Uh, you need to talk about vaccinations and vaccines and um, damages. Mm. You can charge for damages for an assistance animal. You need to talk about um, pest controls such as fleas. I've gone into a vacant unit, had on some light colored pants, left out covered in fleas. You need to talk about that in the policy. Is that going to be a charge to the resident or is that going to be a part of your pest services? Those kind of things. Does that make sense? Anybody have anything else they want to say about that? Anybody having any trouble with that? No? Okay. I haven't seen too many of those policies, no. really. Um, I've only, 
I've only seen them in the larger uh, management companies. You know, they they have uh, these big insurance policies that they're paying, and they kind of cover everything. But even in the smaller ones, if you have not thought about it and you have an elderly property, you know we have plenty of assistance animals on elderly properties. But even with family properties, at one time back in the 80, uh, was it the 80s? Well, one time back there, I've been in this business alone. One time, <laughs> what we had was we had Miss Smith getting an assistance animal for her son or daughter. And then Miss Jones finding out about it. Miss Jones wanting a dog for her son or daughter. Do y'all remember when that was rampant? If you've been in the business 20 years or more, the next thing you know, on a family property that had a no pet policy, you had about 10, 15 assistance animals. They were not pets. So you do need, if you have a family property, you do need some policies and some things like that to help you also, not just the uh, elderly properties. Next. Okay, excuse me. Um, it would be a good idea to add the HUD VAWA forms 5381 and 5384 to the third reminder notice or the lease termination notice and demand for, they cut it off. Demand for possession. Demand for possession. <laughs> that's like if you're putting them out. Uh, a lot of these terms are, are new to Ebony, but that's like you have a termination and an eviction, demand for possession. Now, it's real important that you read this sentence because this sentence is tricky. Now, Cindy, you can't answer this because you know the answer. But anybody else, can you tell me what's tricky about this particular one? The wrong form numbers. Very good. The wrong form numbers. It's not the 5381 and the 5384. It's the 5380 and the 5382. But the consensus is still the same. If you, you have to produce the 5380 and the 5382 for evictions. You have to produce someone else. When they move in, when they move in, you have to give them one. And rejection. And rejections. If you reject an applicant, then you have to, with your rejection notice, you have to give them the 5380 and the 5382 form, the VAWA 5380 and the 5382 form. And Cindy, Elizabeth, I got a little nap, y'all. Y'all, excuse me. I'm not gonna... <laughs> uh, Cindy and Elizabeth, and I see we had Keith on for a short second. These guys are looking for those when they come out to your property. When they come out to the property, they're going to look at your rejection letter, and they're going to ask you, did you send these notices? A lot of management companies are adding those to the rejection letters to be a reminder to the manager to make sure that they send them and for evidence that they were given. Very good. Yeah, that's been a big finding that I've had, that they're not um, producing evidence that they gave those for rejections. Yes. That's one of those really gray and really sneaky areas. Um, anybody else have any comments? Is everybody doing this? Is it anybody who didn't know that you had to do those? Okay. Ebony, the next one. Original initial copies with signatures of the EIV, CAF, uh, UAAF, and owner's letter are to be provided at the MOR review. True or false? Five of 16 voting and all of them are saying true. Six. All of them saying true. Seven, thank you for your votes. Eight, thank you. Okay, with 50% voting, um, they 56%, uh, they all say true. It is true. 
you do have to have the original and um, the original should have a signature. We just recently had a um, appeal. We had an MOR appeal and the manager says, well, I gave that RM my information and I gave them my original documents, but it wasn't the original document. It was a document offline and it had no signatures and we could tell it wasn't the original document. You have to have the original document plus the latest documents of those forms. And don't forget to take your cyber awareness test. The little challenge with the little gentleman, he's, he, he, he's coming along. He used to be a real weird little fellow, but he's coming along. So don't forget to take your cyber awareness challenge also. Um, Elizabeth, would you like to make any comments on that? Or Keith, are you all having any trouble when you go out in the field with that? Uh, this is Keith. No, I, I have not had any problems with those. Those, are, those have been good for me. Okay. Um, this is Latrenda. I do experience quite a bit of problem with the originals. Okay. And what has that experience? They don't, they don't understand. They don't understand. Well, some of them, well, we didn't, we didn't know we had to keep up with that or the original. Um, some don't know what the document looks like. I'm like, it's like five or seven pages to it. It has a signature. It's going to be the original one. You'll know it because it has rude behavior and it is that and other. And then they're still like, giving me that one sheet that says recertification. So it takes a while through the MRI. So I always do that as soon as I get there to give them time to keep get up to what, what I'm looking for. But I have a hard time with the initial. Okay. And I put this on because a lot of times uh, when they do the appeal, they you're right, Latrinda, they don't know what the forms look like or what we're actually asking for. When we schedule the MOR, this is a part of the uh, Addendum C form and HUD wants the original. Another thing that they have trouble with is the original owner's letter. Sometimes they'll have the CAAF and the UAAF, but they don't have the owner's letter that's given the coordinator permission to conduct the EIV reports and findings and what have you for them. Uh, Cindy, do you have any trouble with that one? Yes. Okay. Yes, I have. Um, most of the time they have most of it, but like they sometimes don't always have the current UAAF or um, CAAF. So what I do is show them where they can get it on EIV because you can go in EIV and they can print out the most current ones. So I do training on that because, you know, I've dealt with this before <laughs> in my other past. <laughs> um, so I go in there and show them where they can get that information, especially for the site people, for the UAAFs if they don't have them. Because a lot of them don't know that they're supposed to do this every six months. Okay. And so sometimes the higher up people do it for them. Mm -hmm. You can also find them online. You can just Google uh, HUD, EIV, CAAF, and UAAF forms, and they'll come up, and you can print them out. Now, uh, to be honest with you, this appeal that I just had, the lady um, was upset with the relationship manager because he or she did not allow them to mail it to them after they left. This is a form that we're collecting while we're there. Uh, there are a lot of times that, um, you know, Navigate extends that olive branch that uh, they say I invented and we need to break. But there are a lot of times the, the purpose of the exit interview is to give you the opportunity to produce the things that are not there. But when we send the letter out, the Addendum C tells you that you need these forms. So in my mind, you've had plenty of time to get them and mm -hmm. or that relationship manager to ask he or she, what are you looking for? What is this form? What do I need? So that's kind of what we're, we're expecting you guys to do. So thank you all for that input. And uh, Latrenda, uh, Latrenda, do you want to show your face, you and Keith? I introduced the other RMs earlier. They're all shy. No. <laughs> I had a hair appointment. 
I had a girl appointment yesterday, but the lights went out, and so I'm like in halfway in, halfway out. <laughs> I understand. I understand. They don't want to see that. <laughs> uh, I told them I was doing my makeup on the way to uh, today. Latrenda is in our Mississippi office, and they are having trouble down there. We discussed that at the top of the uh, session. And hi, Keith. Keith's in our Virginia office. And um, so I'm in Connecticut. In, they're the huge I'm sorry, Connecticut <laughs> office. Yeah, yeah. Cindy's in our Virginia office. You're in our Connecticut office. I get I <laughs> so long. I get them mixed up. That's quite all right. Good to see you. Good to see hey, you. Kevin. Are we ready for the next question? Yes, next, Ebony. Okay. In all the states where marijuana is legal, HUD residents are allowed to use marijuana on property because it is acceptable as a state law. And we've covered this quite a bit. Yeah, we uh -huh. had just a tip about two weeks ago, three weeks ago. All right, six of 16 voting, all of them say false. Very good, false. I'm so proud of you guys. Uh, everybody knows this one. We're up to 10 of 16, they all say false. Okay, and that is true. HUD says no. They don't care what the state law says. Marijuana is not permitted on the HUD crop. So everybody got that one. Okay, next. Okay, and I think this is gonna be the last one. House rules that are listed on the acknowledgement sheet signed by the resident do not have to be in the file. True or false? Hmm. That's a tricky one. Eight of 16, 50% voting, all of them say false. Anybody else voting? Okay. Eight of 16 say false. That's 100% of those voting. Let's look at the question. House rules. You're, they're listed on your acknowledgement sheet, and the acknowledgement sheet is signed by the resident. Let's take away, you know, when you're taking a quiz, you take away all the unnecessary words. So let's say house rules have to be in the file, true or false. Does that change your mind about the way that you're voted? House rules are part of the file. Now, true, I'm gonna tell you the honest to God truth. Half of the managers don't put the house rules in the files, but they're supposed to be in the files. They're supposed to be in the files because they are a HUD approved attachment to the lease. They're part of the legal documents. They, they are legal document. House rules don't have to have signatures, but they are an attachment to the lease and they should be in the files. Now, have people been writing up findings for it? At Navigate, not so much. I've gone out on um, reviews with some of the RMs and I've noticed that they are not in the file and I've come back and noticed that they're not giving a finding for it. However, there are some contract administrators and those of you who have contract administrators in other areas uh, know that you will get a finding if the house rules are not attached to the lease in the file because they are an attachment to the lease. They're just like that VAWA form. Everybody puts that VAWA form in the files because it's an attachment to the lease. And the excuses that I have been given is, oh, Miss Vicky, our house rules are that thick, and that's just too much. That's just too much to put in there. But um, there's a new sheriff in our town. We have a new um, deputy director, and I think that 
navigate will start making sure that the house rules are also attached to the lease and a part of can I, the town. Can I just go ahead? Can I just say this? Now, the house rules should be in the file, must be in the file, but they shouldn't be signed and put in the file at annual recertification every time unless there's changes. Right. True. True. Um, the, the caller was saying that the house rules must be in the file. She knows that, but, and they don't have to be signed. It doesn't have a signature on it. A lot of people put that acknowledgement because the residents say they didn't get a house rule when we have resident complaints. But you don't have to put one in there every year, just like you don't have to put the lead-based paint in there at each certification, because that will make your files cumbersome. Uh, you only need one unless you change your house rules. And if you have a change to your house rules, you have to give the residents how much time? 60 days. You have to give them 60 days to accept those changes. And if they don't accept the changes, they can give you 30 days notice that they're going to move. Thank you, Carla. That is, that is really um, a good point that you don't have to put them in every year. And there are a lot of things that people don't have to put in every year. There are a lot of things that make your, your files thick that you don't have to do. You have an acknowledgement sheet. And then a lot of managers have all of the documents that's on the sheet. That was the purpose of the sheet. You don't have to have an EID and you, um, how your rent's determined. If you have an acknowledgement sheet, you don't have to have a copy of those pamphlets and brochures in your file also every year. Anybody else have any comments? Anybody got any um, findings that they received either from Navigate or another contract administrator that they thought were really, really crazy? Mm -hmm. I'm just glad the house rules just came up because I just had this to happen recently. And even after going to the 4350 during the MOR, it was still debated that the house rules did not need to be in the file as an attachment. And so, you know, I'm glad it came up um, that it is supposed to be in the file. Uh, I have written it up before. I don't know about everybody else, but I have written it up if it's not there. Okay. Good. Yeah, because it's actually listed on that last page of the lease that it's an attachment to the lease. So usually, like if you have the VAWA and all that listed on the back with the 5-9, the house rules and the VAWA, then that's part of your lease. So it should be in there to support whatever you say in your lease. Exactly, exactly. Um, so yeah, I have I have uh, issued a finding for that, um, Ms. Vicky. Okay. I, I haven't have, seen that. I have seen some findings uh, that the Navigate REMs have written. And then I have seen some, like I say, where they have not. Uh, there is one more gray area that we did make it a question. I'm calling it a bonus uh, because we have recently had this to come up and it was the HUD um, account executive who brought it to the attention of a manager. You guys are supposed to have HUD's name and contact information or your contract administrator's name and information posted somewhere so that the residents can see it. If they have an issue and they can't talk to management about it, um, we get resident complaints as many of you know, but HUD gets the complaints also. A lot of time HUD refers them to us. And in this particular case, uh, the HUD AE had asked the resident well, did you not see Navigate's name posted in the office? You need to call Navigate and tell them about this issue. And they told them, no, there's nothing posted in the office about who we should contact or who we should not contact. So when I talked to the AE, the HUD account executive, he wanted me to make sure that I told management that they needed to post the contract administrator's contact information in their office somewhere that the residents would see it. Most people put it on a bulletin board, but that covers our gray areas. That covers all of our little gray areas that we have. So now I have one other thing to tell you about. 
First, I want to know if you guys have any comments, any things you want to say, anything you think that we you want to um, to discuss in reference to findings, in reference to your MOR. I do want to say this, especially if any of the people who have made an MOR appeal are on the um, are on with us. If you appeal your MOR to us and we say that our rating stands, your next thing is to appeal it to HUD. I have a lot of people who will say, well, won't you take this into consideration and won't you take that into consideration? Once we have made a determining factor, we will allow you to appeal, but if we say that our answer did not change, our status did not change, then you have to appeal that to HUD because HUD's the only one who can reverse that decision. Okay, so keep that in mind. And in your appeal letter, it'll tell you where in the uh, 4381 handbook you can find that and that kind of thing. Don't be upset. We just have, we have to follow protocol, just like you all have to follow protocol. So that, yes. I have a um and if they don't have it posted in the office, but they actually have a form that they give the residents that tell them the um, steps of complaints on who you contact first and the next person and the next person, does that suffice? It would not to me, Cindy. And I say okay. that because um, when they go in to sign their lease, they're given a whole lot of documents. They're given them. Yeah the house rules they're given those things that they acknowledge that they have and when they call in with a resident complaint you ask them you say well um at your move-in was the stove broken or at move-in was a pipe leaking uh i think it was yeah 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 it was well your move-in inspection report does it show it what's a move-in inspection report that's a document yeah got when you moved in so it needs to be something you know they put these some people keep up with everything. everything. People like me have a catch 99 file. And then we oh, yeah. put the catch 99 file. So I would say it still needs to be posted in the office. Okay. That would be the grievance procedure, wouldn't it? Yes. The, the, the grievance procedure should be posted in the office, yes, and it should have on there who to contact if you don't want to talk to management and you have a grievance with management. A lot of people have a grievance procedure, plus they have a separate paper I've seen posted. Um, if you need to talk to HUD of contract administration, uh, administrator, here's the information. But it is a part uh, of the grievance procedure, yes. And your grievance procedure should be posted. Along with your uh, contract rents should be posted. There are a lot of postings that should be um, in the office that a lot of times people aren't posting or don't have there. But so we'll, let me ask. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So let me ask this question. Does the tenant selection plan need to be in the tenant file or can you have a signature page that they all receive a copy of the tenant selection plan? The tenant selection plan does not have to be in the file. I have not read anywhere in the handbook where it says that it's a part of the resident's file because the tenant selection plan is for applicants and the resident file is for the residents. Now, the tenant selection plan should be posted or it should be given to the applicants so that they will know what's required of them to live at that particular property. Most people, or I say most people, excuse me, most managers do not give the tenant selection plan out because usually it's 10, 12, 13, 14 pages, and they might have applicants who come in and get it and don't come back. So a lot of them will post it on a bulletin board or somewhere in the office and tell the applicants that a copy is available up on request. That's the way I see it most of the time. Now, you all are managers. So can somebody tell me, Cherry, what do you all do about the tenant selection plan?
And while Cherry uh, cuts on her mic caller, what do you all do about the tenant selection plan? We provide all applicants with a copy of the tenant selection plan and have them sign a signature page stating that they receive a copy of the tenant selection plan and we post the tenant selection plan. Okay. Okay. That's good. Y'all go what they call above and beyond. Anybody else? We only post the uh, tenant selection plan in the office, and if anyone wants a copy, then we will provide it to them. Okay. Carrie, what do you all do? Carrie? Okay, no answer from Carrie. She doesn't want to talk to me today. Miss Bell. Uh, yes. But doesn't the 4350 state that you have to provide all applicants with a copy of the tenant selection plan? The 4350 says that you have to um, provide the, you're right, the tenants with one, but it doesn't say that you have to provide one that they can take with them. You can provide it and it be uh, on the wall and they can take it down and read it. I think that's a matter of the, and uh, tenant selection plans are in chapter four. It says under 4-4, Owners must develop and make public written tenant selection policies and procedures that include descriptions of the eligibility requirements and income limits for admission. The tenant selection plan must include whether or not there's an elderly restriction, so on, so on, so on. It does not say that you have to provide them with one uh, to take with them. It says that owners must develop and make public written tenant selection plans. And the reason I say that is because when I started in the industry, well, I'll, I'll, I won't go that far back. When I started with Jeffco, which used to be Navigate, um, we used to get findings for, for that. We gave findings for them not giving the tenant selection plan out with the application. And uh, they called HUD and they said that it was expensive to produce and copy and print this paper for people who don't even bring the applications back. And that's when we were pointed to the paragraph that we have to make it public. It has to be written and we have to make it public. But there's nowhere in the 4350 that I have read. And if you find it, send it to me and I'll make a correction that you have to actually provide them with one. It has to be there. And if they want one to take with them to read upon request, then you need to give them one. Miss Vicki? Yes. Carrie said that she was having mic issues, but they do post it. Okay, great. Thank you, Carrie. I just thought you didn't want to talk to me. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, not to keep you too long because Ebony gets at me by running over my time. But let me just say this. I've been in this business about 35, 40 years. I'm gonna say 35 plus because y'all start trying to add up my age. Um, I've had a wide spectrum of roles in this industry like being a manager, regional manager. I even own real estate and apartment complexes at one time. Uh, I've been an independent contractor for HUD. I now work for the contract administrators. I've uh, been a REACT inspector and I've been an HDS inspector. I'm saying all that to say that I have seen this industry have changes that have made people come and go. EID almost made me go. Many of you probably were right there with me when I said, oh no, uh -uh, this is just too much can't do this. But I thought prior to 2020 that I had seen it all. I thought that, you know, oh, there's nothing else. But then the pandemic came and I had never seen anything like this in the housing industry. Not only did it affect our industry, but it affected every industry. Um, it affected families, people. Um, and it took a lot to get everyone on board. And we still have some people who are, uh, treading the water with things like EIV. So I know it's gonna take a lot for us to get on board with the pandemic. 
Um, in March of 2020, a tidal wave of change kind of washed away business as we were used to doing it. You know, we called it normal what we were doing. Now we have a new norm. So our September series is going to be on our new norm. We're going to talk about um, some things that affect managers, such as uh, the challenges, the plan. Our caller that had called in talked about um, changing the house rules. Well, if you have not changed your house rules from when they were in 2015, it's time. Because there needs to be some new changes with this pandemic that will affect your house rules even. Uh, we have new challenges coming for, you know, we were praying and hoping, okay, come on, COVID-19, hurry up and pass. Let us get back to life as we knew it. But then comes Delta. And what's the new one, uh, Ebony? Lambda. Lambda. Here comes Lambda. And then probably Samda, Bamda, and all the rest of them coming up. You know, the whole Greek alphabet will probably be following Lambda. Um, we're going to have to make some changes. And death is a, a, a funny thing. And I say death is a funny thing because I'm not trying to be morbid, but I have a friend who just lost a relative. But the relative was sick, and I told her that she was given the time to say goodbye, opposed to it being a quick accident and they were taken just like that, or like the troops that were in Afghanistan, those 13 people. Um, time is on our side now. But we could see Delta creeping in, just like we saw COVID creeping in. It was March of 2020. We were sitting there, okay, this is going to last about three months. We were even told that, you know, this is going to last about six months, then you'll be back. I don't believe that anymore. So while we have time, let's work on our challenges. Let's work on a plan. We had more residents that called us. They won't let us go to ABC store. They take, this was a senior property. The manager was doing all she could. She was getting the residents from the senior property up and out at seven o'clock in the morning. She had a local grocery store that would not even open the doors to the public until eight, until these seniors could get in, get their groceries, get out and get back to their complex, to their properties. Well, one of the seniors didn't like it because it was a Piggly Wiggly and she doesn't shop at Piggly Wiggly. She shops at Winn-Dixie and she doesn't understand why she's got to sign something to, to sign out and sign something to sign back in when she comes back from Winn-Dixie. Management was only trying to keep up with where she had gone in case she did indeed contact COVID, right? So let's just get us a plan together about what we plan to do, which would probably change a lot of our house rules. I don't know how many of you all are on mandated masks when you're in the office, but that needs to be a part of your house rules. Now, HUD had already given us a, a system for things like the tornadoes and the hurricanes. They already had a plan. Look at that plan. See if there are things that are involved there that you need to incorporate into your new norm plan and adjust your house rules and things likewise. Let your residents know what's expected of them. And look at your workload balance. You know, if we have, and I don't think they'll ever shut the country down again because that was a catastrophe, but if we have to be on our own personal lockdowns, a lot of the governors are leaving it to the mayors and the mayors are leaving it to the people. If we have to be on our own personal lockdowns at our properties, what are you expecting from the residents and how will they know what you're expecting. Uh, Mary Ross has a great little thing that she was using. Uh, she's just as friendly and sweet as forever. If you need some help from her, she'll be glad to help you. Um, consider your staff and the adaptability of your staff. Some of us worked through COVID. You know, we were there every day. And so consider that. And along with that 
consideration of staff, hopefully we can have some exercises that kind of just let you get rid of the pressure, you know? Um, I have never taken pressure pills at my age. And when I went to a new doctor, his nurse found that to be quite unusual. Well, she asked me what was my secret. I can't tell y'all on air what my secret is because Navigator probably fired me. But I have, an, I have an escape, right? Everybody <laughs> needs an escape from the stuff that's bending down on you. So we're going to look at that. And then we're going to optimize our opportunities and our workplace health. That's what we're going to do in September. And hopefully in September, we'll have a speaker for our uh, Tuesday Tip Live that will bring us some type of little games, some type of little exercises. I've been working on some things. They have a program where you work 30 minutes and then you take 10 minutes to step back and to stand and to twist and to stretch. They said that that relieves some of the pressure here. So we're going to be talking about and doing a lot of those things. And then for October, we're going to talk about react inspections. You know, we're not on the inspire yet, but we're going to be talking about react inspections. What is that? I'm sorry. Oh, she goes fishing. That's her release. She's showing us this big fish she caught. So um, in October, we're going to have a guest react inspector who does or who's on the inspire board. And so if you have questions, if you have been lucky enough, fortunate enough to have a upcoming react inspection and you have questions for her, she's willing to answer all of our questions. Chris and Ebony are going to, um, as they advertise the Tuesday tips, put something out there so you can send us your questions ahead of time. And she won't be bombarded that fourth Tuesday in October with questions. And so I want you to stay safe. I want you to join us next week for another Tuesday tip. I want to thank you guys, uh, especially those in Mississippi who, who are working and out there. Let us keep everybody lifted in Louisiana. And there's going to be a lot of repercussion from Afghanistan. Uh, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be applying to your properties from the moratorium. Let's build a better workplace for everybody, for us and everybody else. You guys take care, and I enjoyed you on today's Tuesday Tip. Thank you guys for tuning Thank in. Thank you, Vicki. Yes, y'all take Thank care. Thank you. Have a great day. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.